welcome, 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 Discover Family Church. It is Sunday, and I'm excited to have you here this morning with us as we get ready to to finish up talking about Won't You Be My Neighbor. And, and if this is your first time, we want to say thank you. We are so excited to have you today. If this is your first time, I'm Pastor Johnny. I'm the pastor here at Discover Family Church, and we'd love to have you uh be a part of what we're doing. And, and one of the ways that you can get started with that is just go to our front page of our website, discoverfamilychurch.com. And right at the bottom there, we have something that we call our connection card. Go and fill that out. It's real simple and you send it in to us. Promise no hassle. All I'm going to do is send you a quick email with a gift from Discover Family Church just saying, hey, thanks for joining us this morning. Let's us know you're here. I can answer any questions for you. I can pray with you if you have any needs or anything like that. But it lets us know you're here. It lets me send a quick gift to you and say thanks. So I encourage you to do that. Go to the front page of the website and fill out the connection card this morning. Hope you guys are having a great day. Uh, hopefully, you're more, more and more of you are watching on our website. We want to see more and more people moving to our website instead of watching on Facebook or YouTube. Um, there's a, a couple of reasons, but the biggest one being that, that our website offers a better experience. There's easier ways to chat and talk with each other, to get individualized, personalized, private prayer times with somebody from our lead team that can pray with you. And then beyond that, uh, honestly, I in today's climate, I don't know how long we'll be able to continue doing what we do when it comes to Facebook and YouTube. Uh, I'm not a conspiracy theorist or anything like that, but but I, I do know that, that we live in a world that um, is closing off more and more to the church, and we can control what's going on our website. So I encourage you to jump on the website, uh, discoverfamilychurch.com. It's a click to click to watch button right there and do that. But wherever you're watching right now, whether you're watching on our website, uh, our Facebook page, or our YouTube page, do me a favor, click click uh, share, invite your friends, start a watch party, whatever it is, you know, go, let people know about this so they can join you today and, and, and see what's going on at Discover Family Church. At the end of service, if you say, you know what, that message would be perfect for my friend, you know, whoever, I encourage you to share it with them. You know, tag them in it, let them see it. As soon as service is over, this video goes live uh, for you guys to rewatch and rewatch. And so I encourage you to do that as well. And while you're there, make sure you're following, you're subscribing on YouTube, Facebook, anywhere else that we're at so that we can keep you up to date with what's going on. And, and speaking of what's going on, uh, some cool news. Okay, so as a church, we've been meeting now. Um, we are starting our sixth month, I believe, in March, April, May, June, July, August. This is the start of the sixth month that we've been meeting online only. Wow, it does not seem like that long, but it has been. Um, and and we've done that for a few reasons. A lot of churches have started meeting. We've watched churches start meeting, then go back to online only, then go back to in-person again. And then honestly, not seeing a, a ton of people attend in person. There's a lot of people that are uh, dealing with, with uh, immune deficiencies, people that are still, you know, maybe sick or worried about getting sick or just being cautious. And we understand all that. And, and we as a church have tried to be really cautious and make sure that we we're always looking to keep you safe. Uh, but that being said, we, we, are, we still are in our building for the, for the short time being. Um, we, we have not completely moved out. And we still have it sitting here. And so we've been talking and we've decided um, to not, we're not doing like some big like, hey, we're opening up again. Can everybody come in? We're not trying to pressure people into coming to service. But we do want to offer an opportunity for those that are comfortable to come and be a part of service. And so starting next Sunday, August 9th, we will start having Sunday morning uh, service, a very stripped down, it's going to look different than it used to, it's going to feel different than it used to, uh, at 10 a.m., just like our normal time. We, we're not going to have coffee. Uh, we're going to ask everybody to wear a mask because the, the way the state is laying it out is that basically we can either social distance completely or wear a mask. And, and we don't have a big enough room to completely social distance. We can do a decent job of it, but there will be times when it's hard to do it completely, and so we're asking everybody to wear a mask, uh, and we'll have hand sanitizer. The room will be disinfected and cleaned and ready to go. Uh, we're not going to have kids service. It's going to be family-style worship, and we encourage you to bring your kids, have them in, in, enjoy a, a time of worship with us, uh, but that's starting next Sunday at 10 a.m., and it's going to be a different service than what's online. What do I mean? We've grown so much online. We have people, I've been able to lead people to the Lord around the country. We have people watching not just in Lakeland, but 
around the state of Florida, uh, people in Texas, we have people in Ohio, people in California, uh, people in the Carolinas, in Georgia. We've had multiple people that I get messages all the time from people around the country that are watching what we're doing. And our online services have gone really well. And part of the reason I think they've gone well is that it's real personal. It doesn't feel like you're watching you know, from the back of the room during a church service, but instead it's me talking with you. And so that's not changing. We are not going to make all of you that are watching online start watching sort of a, uh, you know, an unleaded version of our regular Sunday service. Instead, we are going to, it's going to require a little extra work on our part, but we think it's smart and we think it, it, it's healthy for you guys, for those that, that aren't ready to come back, and we are totally fine with it. We're not pushing that you need to come back. We're giving you the opportunity if you'd like to. Um, but for those that are going to continue to watch online, we're going to continue doing this and having our personal dialogue. And so we're going to continue recording and, and, and getting it ready just like this for you guys on Sunday morning uh, online. But we will be doing a live service in the room here for those that feel like they're ready to do that or they want to do that. And so starting next Sunday, if you'd like to come, we'd love to have you. If not, we'll still be here just the way we have been. And we'd love to see you in either one of those locations on our website or in person next Sunday starting at 10 a.m. Uh, as we get ready to move into the rest of the service today, uh, I want to give you guys a chance to worship God. And worship, for so many times, we, worship, we, we always think about worshiping with our hands, singing, lifting our voices, uh, and we forget about the other times, and, and honestly, the time that, that the Bible talks about more than anything, that worship through our giving. Uh, it's easy for us to give of our time. It's easy for us to give of our talents to God, but for some reason, we have a hard time giving of our treasure. And the reason why is this, is because it's giving something that is one of the most important things to our lives. It's what sustains us at times, you know. It keeps us a, a roof over our heads, or at least we think it keeps a roof over our heads. We think it feeds us. We serve a God that's taking care of all that for us. But the truth is, is that we, we feel that, that that's a step too far a lot of times. But, the, but when we look at our life, we honestly, we, we, we show that kind of devotion in a lot of areas. Let me ask every husband and wife out there, how often do you go to a restaurant that's not your first pick because you know your spouse wants to go there? Yeah, how many times do you want to rest at home but your kids want to go to the park? So you say, okay, let's go. How many times do you make those sacrifices to say, I'm going to do something that's not necessarily what I want to do because I love you that much? That's worship, and that's the way God wants us to be with him. So when we give of our, our, our treasure, what we're saying to God is you're more important than what I want. You're more important than anything to me. That's why worshiping with our giving is such an important thing. And we are not a, you know, name it, claim it, prosperity-driven church. I'm not going to tell you that if you give $100 uh, today that $1,000 is going to appear in your account next week. I'm not going to tell you that because that's probably not going to happen. And if it does, it has nothing to do with that. I will tell you this, that when you give, your relationship with him will grow in prosperity. It will grow drastically. When you worship him by giving sacrificially, it's amazing how much deeper your relationship with him grows. How much you, you, hear, you hear from him easier. You, you, you feel closer to him on a day-to-day -day basis because you're giving not because just because you have to, but because you want to. You're giving because he's the most important thing and you're doing everything you can to show him that. And so today, if you would like to support and give that way, especially as we get ready to step into the next season, we got some cool stuff we're working on for the next season of our church. And I can't wait as, as we get some, some answers to be able to share some things with you coming up here in the coming weeks and months. But, but as we get through this, uh, when you want to give, we, we appreciate it and we love that. Uh, and if you'd like to do that today, I encourage you to do that, but I'm not telling you what to do or how to do it. All I'm going to simply say is, hey, ask him what he would have you do and then do that. I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm going to say, hey, ask God what he'd have you do and then do that. Because then you're doing, you're worshiping. You're not just following orders. I want you to worship him with your giving, to worship him. It's easy to worship in a room with 100 people singing together. That's easy. Sometimes it's harder to say, I'm going to give to you in a moment when nobody else is looking. But today, I encourage you to do that. And for those of you that can't do that, 
we have so many people that are walking through hard moments. You've lost jobs, you've lost hours, you've lost money, and you are, you're struggling right now. And you're like, Pastor Johnny, I want to, but I don't have it. I understand. And we're going to pray for you right now as we pray for our offering because we serve a God that's bigger than the problems we're facing. Amen? I mean, let's pray right now. Father, I, I lift up those that are walking through a scary moment. There are people in our church that are scared, that are worried. They don't have money in their bank account. They don't know where their rent's going to come from or how they're going to feed their families. But God, we know that you are not just the God that provides, the Jehovah Jireh, the God, the provider, but that you are the God that comforts. And so in the middle of this scary moment, I pray that you would be comfort to those that are scared. That God, in the middle of the, the moment when we don't know how, where we're going to see our next meal or our rent come from, we pray that you would be the provider. God, you are bigger than our problems and you love us. You want to take care of us. And so I pray right now that provision, that comfort, that peace into the lives of the people that, that, that need that right now. And for those that are ready and, and excited to worship you with their giving today, God, I pray that you would bless them. Bless their gift the way that your Bible says you would, that they will grow closer to you. That this worship that they give you will not be forgotten, it won't be ignored, but instead it will grow them a relationship closer to you than they ever have had before. I pray you'd bless the gift as well. We love you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Either way you want to give, you can give on our website, discoverfamilychurch.com slash give. You can also give by texting. You can text your, the amount you want to give to 863-226-1180, and you can give right there. Or like some people are still doing, you can mail a check in. You say, hey, I don't, I don't maybe you don't trust, you know, technology, and that's totally fine. You can mail a check in, Discover Family Church, to, uh, our website's the address or the address right here. Mail that in. Either way, you can give. There's lots of ways to give, and we do that just to make it easier for you. Uh, and, and we thank you for being a part of the journey as we get to reach out. I mean, some of these people I've been able to lead to Jesus around the country, that's happened because you have given. And so thank you for doing that and trusting us enough to say, you know what, God, I want, I want to worship you by giving to Discover. We thank you and we appreciate that. We're humbled by that. Finally, we are Discover Family Church. We love kids. And we are putting, we, while we might not be having kids meetings in person right now, we are having some awesome stuff for our kids each and every week. About an hour ago at nine o'clock, our, our three kids services for Sunday dropped. We have a preschool one, an early elementary and a late elementary. They're all on Facebook and YouTube. I encourage you to watch them with your kids. If you don't have kids, go watch the old kids one, the older, the upper elementary one. It's so funny. It is so funny. Me and Sarah die. It's great. It's like Pixar about Jesus. Uh, go watch it. It's fun. Uh, we love it. I encourage you to do that. But uh, for the moment, let's hear a real quick update from Pastor Kim, our incredibly awesome kids pastor at Discover Family Church, about what is going on this week with Disco Kids. Pastor Kim, take it away. Good morning, folks. You know, taking pride in your successes in life, it's a natural reaction. And I think God had the same reaction when he created the heavens and the earth. He looked at it and said, this is good. And last week we were talking in Revelation with the kids about how John was on the island of Patmos and God gave him the vision of what heaven would be all about. And he wrote that down for us. Now we are moving all the way back to the beginning of the Bible, to the book of Genesis, when God creates the heavens and the earth. He looks at it and said, this is good. And that's what our kids will be learning about today. And those can be found, all three services, on the DFC Facebook page. One for preschool, one for lower elementary, and one for upper elementary. Wednesday nights, we are having those Bible cartoons that you can watch five or six minutes long. There's some questions there that you can get the, both the link and the questions off the DFC Facebook page. Uh, take opportunity to be with your kids. Watch them and then ask them some questions. Talk about it. Have a little time of prayer and have a devotion for your, your midweek opportunity, okay? So God bless to each one of you. Have a great day. Uh, this week, I had something crazy happen. I've been working on our house. Uh, I've talked about this multiple times. I've been, we, we put in, I put in new cabinets and countertops and uh, when you do that, you put in a new sink. It's like this undermount sink. It's in, in, it, We used to have one of those old school sinks, the sinks we all grew up with, and a lot of us still have. I'm sure a lot of you have it. It's the two basin sinks. You know, it has that divider in the middle. 
you know, and it's the, the left side's where you put the dirty dishes and the right side usually still just has dirty dishes in it because we all have dishwashers and, and that thing doesn't get used for washing anymore. Uh, some people still wash by hand. That's great. Uh, not me. Uh, I got a dishwasher. Uh, I'm highfalutin. Uh, but so I got this new sink that's gigantic. It's this huge single basin sink. There's no divider in the middle of it. It's just one big basin. It's one of those, you know, hipster sinks. It's all squared off and everything. It's cool looking. It's huge, super deep and big. And, um, and so it only has one drain. And we, now we have a garbage disposal, so it's mounted underneath it. It was tight to fit because the, the sink's deep, but it fit under there. And so the other day I was washing the dishes like late at night, early in the morning. It was like 1.30, 2 in the morning. And uh, I'm washing the dishes, and I hear, kunk. And I'm like, what is that? And then I felt the sensation of warm water rushing over my socks. The garbage disposal fell off. How does, how does that happen? Has anybody comment on this video? Have you had a garbage disposal fall off? It just, it fell, it fell off. How does a garbage disposal fall off? It fell off. And luckily, I got the water stopped. I got the shop vac out, and I'm, you know, getting all the water out from it. It didn't mess up anything. It was. Just, it wasn't a ton of water. I caught it right away. But actually, you know, I. I never. I never cleaned out that shop vac. Oh. I bet that stinks. Ooh. Oh, yuck, yuck, ooh, like dirty dishwater. It's been sitting in a shop vac in my garage. I'll tell Arliss that if he dumps it, that I'll get him a donut. That's how, I'll, I'd love having kids, man. You can get them to do all the stuff you don't want to do. Uh, <laughs> anyways, that's fun. Uh, that, that was part of my week, and you know, my socks got soaking wet with gross water uh it's fun stuff i we're we're sort of finishing up what we've been talking about we've been talking through the idea of how, won't you be my neighbor is sort of what i've couched this whole uh idea about you know what we can do to be a good neighbor to people uh what we can do as a church to take the lessons that we've learned in our head and our heart and actually put feet on them and actually do something to help those around us uh, we talked about, uh, last week we talked about, you know, um, embracing the orphans, those that, are, that, 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 that through no fault of their own are alone and they're familyless and they need a family and how uh, that, that was something that the church was plan A, that the church is God's solution to fix that. Now, when I say church, I'm not talking about just like Discover Family Church or a certain religion or a certain group. I'm saying the the church, the, the, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, the church, Christians, us, we are the solution to embracing the orphans that need love and need a family. I talked the week before that about empowering those that are poor. And we talked about how poverty is not a, not a, a lack of material things, but it's a mindset. It's hopelessness. And the church, we are hope dealers. And so it is our, we are we are plan A to help empower people that are in poverty. And then the first week we actually talked about loving people that are lonely, that feel alone. And the church is called the church family for a reason, that, that, that we are here to love those that are depressed and alone and, and need somebody that we are called to be the answer. And so this week we're talking about something that, that honestly I'm a little nervous to talk about. Um, it's a very big subject. It's a very important subject. But I'm nervous to talk about it. And I've watched other churches talk about this head on. I've watched a lot of churches sort of skirt around it. And I've watched a lot of churches ignore it completely. And I've wanted to talk about this, but I, I've waited because I've wanted to make sure that I had my thoughts right and what I believe God wants me to say. And that topic that I'm going to talk about today is racism. And this is a, a huge topic. And, and, and just like orphans that, that need to be embraced or those that are in poverty need, need to be empowered and those that are lonely need to find love, reconciling racism 
the church is God's solution to this. The church is God's solution to all of this stuff. God's plan was for us to fix it. It wasn't for, for any of the other things that we see on the news or ideas that people come up with. You know, I'm not saying they're bad ideas, but they're not the answer. They may be a band-aid. They may help for decades, but they are not the answer. The answer is the church. And I want to start this whole talk by, by acknowledging something that I am white. <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming you all knew that, but in case you didn't know, I'm a white guy. And that means I'm walking into this subject with a limited perspective. I'm walking into this subject with, with not a full scope of everything. But I want you to also know that I'm walking into it with a pure heart. That I'm walking into this um, trying to do my best to talk about something that is very very important to the hearts and lives and minds of people across this planet on an issue that I believe is at the very core. Won't you hear me on this? An issue that I believe is at the very core of Jesus' heart. And an issue that I believe that the church is called to be leaders in showing love so as we go through this, uh, just know that, that I, I may not have a complete perspective, but that's why I'm letting God guide us on this one here. And so I want to open by talking about a, a, a passage from the Bible. And it's a story that we've all heard a million times. We, we all know it. In fact, if, if you've never been to church before in your life, you've heard of the Good Samaritan. We all have. You know, if you went to church when you were a kid, then you had the flannel board. You guys remember those? The blue, ours were always light blue. Sometimes they were green, but it's like a felt board, and you had the the little paper characters with fuzzy things in the back, so it would stick. If, if you know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about, but for those of you that have no idea what I'm talking about, I look insane, and I just realized that. Um, anyways, it's a story we all learned our whole lives. We all heard about it, but the, the truth is, is that Jesus, when he tells this story, um, he's speaking about how to neighbor, but honestly, it, the actuality of what he's talking about is racism. And we may not have ever realized that, but he's talking about racism. It's exactly what he's talking about. And I want to, I want to share that. And so how does the story of the, the Good Samaritan come up? Well, a, a guy who was an expert in the Old Testament law comes up to Jesus and, and, you know, trying to maybe trip up Jesus a little bit, but also trying to get some information. And he basically comes up and he says to Jesus, he says, hey, Jesus, how do I get eternal life? How do I get eternal life? And Jesus does what Jesus did all the time. And I love this. And it's something that I'm going to talk about in a little bit for us. But, but I, we, we can, this ties directly into what we're talking about today. Because what Jesus does is he answers the question with a question. Jesus was all about listening and hearing people's problems, their needs, their hurts, their complaints. So instead of waiting his turn so that he could say what he wanted to say, because what he wanted to say was important, and we can all be honest here, like, like Jesus' words were important, and he wanted to share them. But he always asked a question when somebody asked him a question, because he wanted to hear you talk more. He wanted to hear more of your story. And so Jesus, this guy comes to Jesus and says, hey, how do I get eternal life? How do I inherit eternal life? And Jesus looks at him and says, well, you, you know, you're, you're the expert on the law. What does the law say? And the man looks at him and says, the law says to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus basically says, great, do that. Great, do that. Uh, but, but here's where it gets crazy because the man, he wants to justify himself here. Let me read what he says so I can explain it. Because the man wanted to just, the Bible says in Luke chapter 10, verse 29, but the man wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Basically, he's wanting to justify certain people not being his neighbor. He's saying, so you say to love my neighbor, so who is that? So I can love them, and I don't have to love the rest. He's trying to justify. The Bible says he's trying to justify himself right there. So, so if they like different music than me, you know, like I imagine this dude, you know, he's like, you know, I'm a Yacht Rock guy. 
Hall and oats till I die. And Jesus, now if I come across somebody who they love the smooth jazz sounds of Spyro Gyra, do I have to love them? Are they my neighbor? Now, if, those are two really good references. If you didn't get them, those are really good. Spyro Gyra, come on. When was the last time you heard a pastor talk about Spyro Gyra and smooth jazz in the middle of a sermon? I'm preaching today. Uh, <laughs> he's basically saying, hey, if it's somebody different, who is my neighbor? I, I know God, I'm supposed to love people, but who exactly do I have to love? If I want to get to heaven, if I want eternal life, who has to be, who is my neighbor? If you want me to love my neighbor, I need to know who my neighbor is, is basically what he is saying. In other words, Jesus, do I have to love people that listen to the wrong kind of music? Because everybody knows I listen to the right kind of music. Hall and oats till I die. Yeah. Who do I have to love? Do I have to listen to people? Do I have to love people that maybe weren't educated as much as me? Because I'm smart, and I, need, I want to make sure that, that I'm, I'm with people that are smart. Do I have to love people that aren't as smart as me? Well, you know, what about people that have weird hair or tattoos or piercings? Like, you know, I'm very clean cut, you know. You know, do I, do I need to love them as well? Do I have to love them if they have a different accent than I do? If they speak in a different language? Jesus, do I have to love somebody that has a different skin color? Because I don't really want to do that. This is what this man is asking. He's trying to justify not loving certain people. So he's saying, hey, Jesus, who is my neighbor? Tell me who it is so I can love them. I don't have to love the other people. I, I know I'm supposed to love my neighbor, but I need to know who that includes. And what's interesting right here is that Jesus does another thing that Jesus does a lot right here, which is he doesn't answer the question. He doesn't answer the question of, okay, here's who your neighbor is. Instead, he tells a story, the Good Samaritan. And he tells a story of how to be a neighbor instead of who is your neighbor. And the story explains it all. The Good Samaritan, okay, so we know the story, right? There's a Jewish guy, he's heading down the road, heading to Jericho. He gets jumped. Somebody jumps on him, they rob him, they beat him, they leave him lying on the side of the road. He's probably going to die. And so, what happens? Well, three different people walk by. The first is a Jewish priest. And he walks across the street and keeps walking. The next is a Levite man. Another Jewish man walks by and keeps walking. And then we get to verse 33 of chapter 10 of Luke. And the first three words, we, we will pass by them so quickly. But you need to realize how jaw-dropping these first three words were to that man. Absolutely jaw-dropping. But a Samaritan. So the Jewish priest walked by the Jewish man who was beaten. The Levite walked by the man who was beaten. But a Samaritan. As he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He, he went to him, and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. It's weird. They always put oil and wine on wounds in the Bible. We put it on salad. Uh, Bandages his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And this is absolutely jaw-dropping right here. It's shocking. And, you, and we all have heard the story. Oh, the Jews didn't like the Samaritans. Samaritans didn't like the Jews. We all heard, we've all heard that our whole life. But let's be really honest. I, I want to explain this. Because this wasn't they didn't like each other. This was racism at an ultimate level. And they hated each other. Had daggers for each other. They couldn't stand each other. And this wasn't like a Hatfield and McCoys, like there's a small group of Jewish people that hate a small group of Samaritan people for 30 years because, you know, your family stole my family's cattle or whatever. It was none of that. No, this was, this was a feud that had been lasting between these two races of people for 700 years. How did it happen? It started when the Jewish people were in exile and then they left, but some stayed. And those ones that stayed ended up marrying people of different races. They ended up serving and worshiping other pagan gods and became a race unto themselves. And so the Jewish people 
hated, hated the Samaritans. So what did the Samaritans do? Well, the Samaritans did exactly what all of us do when somebody hates us. We hate them back, right? That's, that's, that's the way of the world for most of us. It's the, what we live in right now, the world we live in right now, there is like no, there's zero ground in the middle. It's, you're all the way over here, you're all the way over here. There's, on every issue, on every topic, on everything, it is so split. And if you are not on my side, then you, then I hate you. That's the world we live in right now. This, this happened, he's talking about something that started 700 years before Jesus' time. This is almost 3,000 years ago. And we haven't learned since. 3,000 years of this. We haven't learned. But what he's, what he's saying is basically like they hated each other. You hate me, well, I hate you back. In fact, it's a competition. Who can hate the most? That's what was happening between the Jewish people and the Samaritans. So whenever Jesus looked at this man and said, but a Samaritan, it was jaw-dropping. That that was who was going to help. And it answered his question completely. Who is my neighbor? I'll tell you who your neighbor is. A Samaritan. The one you hate the most. And all of that, 3,000 years of racism and hatred and bigotry, it was all defeated in one simple act. The Samaritan crossed the street. It wasn't about money. It wasn't about things. It was about being willing to be there. He crossed the street. There's a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King that's absolutely awesome. And it's, he, he's the quote's about the story of the Good Samaritan. Listen to what he says. The first question the priest and Levite asked was, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? But the good Samaritan reversed the question. If I do not stop and help this man, what will happen to him? And this right here, what Jesus is saying, what Dr. Martin Luther King is saying right here, this is the heart of the gospel. It's loving people, even those that are different than you. In fact, I would, I would go as far as to say, especially those that are different than you. Jesus could have used somebody else other than a Samaritan. There, were, there wasn't like there was a lack of people the Jewish people didn't like or that didn't like the Jewish people. But he picked the ones that were the farthest away, the most hated. The gospel, the heart of the gospel is loving people that are different than you. There, there's a quote from the comedian Dennis Leary. He says this. He says, racism isn't born, folks. It's taught. I have a two-year-old son, and you know what he hates? Naps. <laughs> I love that quote. But it's true. Racism is, there's, there's not a racist gene. You're not born that way. It, it is something that is taught, and it's taught through a few different things. It's not just taught by a person. I, I, I think, from, from what I can see, there's really three different ways that you're taught this. And the first one is experience. You, you were treated poorly. You, you were abused, or you were... Whatever, and, 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 and it leads to that thought, that, that way of thinking. The second is it is you're raised that way. And for, for uh, some of you, you grew up in a household where you were raised that way, where you were taught that way. And, and, and it's so easy for us to be passe about it, but th for so many of us, that's the way we were raised. I, I wasn't, uh, but uh, Pastor Kim did not raise me that way. But, but the truth is, is that a lot of us, a lot of you have been. And the third way that I, I, I think a lot of us learn this is through ignorance. We ignore what happens around us. We ignore what we see. We ignore what, what is going on. And, and we keep ourselves naive to hurt and pain and plight and things of that nature. And, and basically, we lack experience and we lack perspective on it. And so why is this so important? I want, I'm going to lay this out and we're going to go through three simple points today. This is important because we talked about this through this whole series that <clears throat> orphans, it, being an orphan isn't about, 
It isn't about just having somebody that you live with. It's about having family and people that love you. People that are in poverty, it's, it's not an issue of the materials they have. We talked about that, that, that it's an issue of hopelessness. That the idea of being lonely is not just nobody's around me, because let's be really honest, some of us are very lonely in the middle of giant groups of people. It's deeper. And in the same way, racism is not, it's not a skin color, it's not a skin issue. It's a sin issue. And if you don't believe me, then hopefully you believe the Bible. James chapter 2, verse 9. I love this. Tra- this is from the New Living Translation of the Bible. James chapter 2, verse 9 says this, But if you favor some people over others, you are committing a sin. You are guilty of breaking the law. I'm going to say that again because James isn't pulling any punches right here. If you favor some people over others, you are committing a sin. You are guilty of breaking the law. And the thing is, is that so often we, we look at somebody and go, well, I'll, I'll hang out with you because you're like me. I'll let my kids hang out with you because my kids are like your kids. I'll hang out. I'll, you know, I'll spend time with you because we make about the same amount of money, whatever. But then other times, you know, well, I know that you're like that and I'm like this. So we can't, you know, we're raised differently. I don't know if we really spend time together. And anytime we act like that, it's not a skin issue. And we need to be able to call it what it is, that it's not right before God. The Bible says so. And it shouldn't be right before the church. And that raises sort of the question of today. Is like, what are we, as followers of Jesus, how are we called to love our neighbors? To love those that may be, act, look, come from a different place than us. How do we love them? Well, there's three simple steps that I think we have to be able to take. And I'm speaking to every side of the discussion here today. Because there isn't, if the one thing the story shows us right here is that there were no innocent parties when it came to the hatred here. And we live in a world where there are no innocent parties when it comes to racism. It is a cancer on our society and it comes from every direction and it comes from sin. So what do we do? The first is we need to be honest and be introspective and be sincere and recognize any prejudices we have. I said prejudice is a little different than racism. And this is difficult to do because Prejudices, a lot of times, they're hard for us to see in ourselves. They're hard to see in a mirror, mostly because a lot of times we feel justified in how we feel about somebody. Um, You know, the Jewish people felt justified in hating the Samaritans because the Samaritans hated them. That's the world we live in right now, folks, is we live in a world that, 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 that we feel justified hating somebody because they hate us back. That's not the Bible. That's not the gospel. That's not Jesus. And even if our prejudice mindset or even if it's a racist attitude isn't intentional, it's still real. It's still born out of sin because it's, it is something that James says, hey, if, if you're preferential to one group over another, it, that's sin. <clears throat> you know, there, there's a pastor... Uh, in Kansas named Pastor Dan Duran, and he is uh, a Hispanic guy, and he had moved into this new city and bought a nice house, and he was mowing his lawn one day, and, and one of the neighbors came up and asked him, how much do you charge to mow lawns? And he laughed it off and thought it was no big deal. You know, it's sort of, oh, it's sort of funny, you know. But I have to be able to look at that from the perspective and be introspective enough to look at it and go, you know what, I've mowed my lawn forever. And nobody's ever come up and asked me that. 
Nobody's ever came up and asked me. And it, it wasn't, I'm, I would be willing to bet that person wasn't intentionally trying to be that way. And, 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 but, but that's the world we live in. It's broken. And so our baseline is broken. Our baseline is sin in this world. It's where it comes from. That's why it's not a skin issue. It's a sin issue. It's so much deeper. Nobody's ever asked me how much I, oh, I take it back. When I was a kid, uh, I wanted to make money. And so I mowed lawns in the neighborhood. And I, oh, I can't believe I want to tell this story. I made flyers up and handed them out to the neighbors. And I called myself the Lawn Ranger. And I would wear a cape and the Lone Ranger mask while I mowed lawns. So just imagine a, a really chubby Johnny pushing a mower. Uh, I was like 11, and I would go mow lawns. Well, you can laugh at me all you want, but I got my first black and white TV that way. Uh, it was pretty sweet. Bought it at a garage sale. Uh, so many times we go, I'm not prejudiced, I'm not, I'm not racist. Let's, let's break it down to real simple terms real quick. Prejudice, what does it mean? Prejudice means prejudging. A preconceived opinion that is not based on reason or actual experience. Now, how often have we been prejudiced to people when we look at it like that? How often have we looked at somebody and said, oh, I bet they're, you know, I bet they're, uh, you know, rich people, you know, they're snobs. They're rich. They must be snobs. Well, that person's heavier. Well, they're, they're probably really lazy, you know. That young generation, man, they don't know how to work. They don't know how to do any of that kind of stuff. You know, um, when I hear pastors, you know, you guys are all crooks. You know, steal money. You know, yeah, old people, you know, they can't teach anything. They, you know, they're just, they're just grumpy and mean. You know, white guys, you guys can't jump. You can't, oh, sorry, that's a movie. Uh, uh, you know, have we ever, have you ever said this, this statement, I'm not racist, but, have you ever, you ever said that? Nothing ever good comes out of your mouth when that's the first part of the sentence. I'm not racist, but, blah. Nothing ever good comes out of that. I'm not racist. You know, I have, I have a black friend. I'm not racist. I, I, and we have to be able to acknowledge our own ignorance, our own naiveness, and how we don't understand some of the things that have happened, some of the things that have gone on. And, and, and we make judgments all the time. You know, if we think back to the way that the country judged people, Middle Eastern people after 9-11. We made judgment calls all the time. We would get scared. And so many times we'll, we'll try and say, oh, it's understandable because of the environment that's going on. But in the end, it's just judging based on somebody's skin. And it, I want to be really honest here because this is something I'm growing in. I, I'm, I'm preaching to myself here today. It takes courage and it takes honesty and it takes integrity to really recognize truthfully any prejudice, any racism, and to be able to admit it before God and repent of it. To say, God, is there a time when I'm judging somebody when I shouldn't be based on something that has no bearing on who they are? Am I giving preferential treatment to somebody for no reason. We have to, step one, is look into our own hearts and be willing to say, I need to learn and grow more here. The second one speaks right into that, which is we need to seek to understand other people. Like I said at the beginning of this message, I have a, a, a limited perspective on all this thing, and, and, and I have to know that. I don't understand how others have been abused, been mistreated, been unfairly rejected. I, I, I don't understand any of this stuff. And it, and, it, and it helps me to be able to enter into a dialogue and spend time talking with those who experience things far different than I have. And that's it, what I did in preparation for this message. I've talked to multiple friends and, 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 and even people that I wasn't necessarily friends with, but said, hey, 
Can I ask some questions? I just want to spend some time learning. I want to grow. I want to seek some knowledge here so I can understand a little bit better. I want to understand the pain that you've walked through. Because once again, that's what Jesus always did. He would look at somebody and he would say, hey, what's going on? Where does this pain come from? Are you, are you hurting because of this? And then he would say, I have healing for you. I have love for you. I have a fix for you. And the fix wasn't what the government said was a fix for their problems. The fix was always love. That's what it always was. Jesus didn't make those that were in pain come to him. He went to where they were. And he spent time with them. If we are to call ourselves like Christ then we have to start acting like him. Ask questions. Learn. Grow. What do we do as Jesus' followers? The, the, the first things that we're going to do is we need to recognize any prejudices, any time, any places in our life where we put preference over somebody, over somebody else, but for no reason other than our own stuff. Second thing is we need to be able to seek and learn and understand from those that are different than us. And then the third thing is, is we need to learn how to love those that are different from us. There's a story, as I close, about a woman crossing the road, like the Good Samaritan. And it's one of the coolest stories. It's from 1996, uh, and, and there was a, a KKK rally happening in Michigan. <clears throat> and obviously, when the KKK rallies, there are protesters that protest. And so the police knew that there was going to be a problem. So the police put barricades and barriers between these two groups of people so that they wouldn't fight. Just let them yell at each other, but just keep them away from each other because they knew it was a powder keg. It was ready to explode. And so in the course of this time, one of the KKK members, he infiltrated, he snuck over to the other side so he could get in the face of these guys and yell at them. And when he did that, the crowd started chanting, kill the Nazi, kill the Nazi. And they started beating the man. And at this moment, this woman, uh, her name was Keisha Thomas. She's an 18-year-old African-American girl. She threw her body on top of the man. I got to here, check out this picture right here. She threw her body on top of this man. She put herself in physical harm, in physical risk to protect, to protect a man that, that by all accounts wanted to harm her. And, and, uh, let me ask you a question today. Who does that? A committed believer does that. This is what she said. Her quote was, I knew, what it, I knew what it was like to be hurt. The many times that that happened to me, I wish someone would have stood up for me. Keisha Thomas, she crossed the street to protect someone that was absolutely and utterly different from her, is completely diametrically opposed from her as it could be. And Thomas says that she, she tries to, if you read stories from her, she tries to do something to break down racial stereotypes every single day. Not grand gestures, not giant things, but she, what she says in her own words is that she believes that small, regular acts of kindness are more important than something grandiose. Her, I love this comment that she said, or this quote. She said, the biggest thing you can do is just be kind to another human being. It can come down to eye contact or a smile. It doesn't have to be a huge monumental act. Church, racism, prejudice, it isn't just the presence of hatred. It's the absence of love. It's the polar opposite. God loves everyone. And we've all said that our whole lives. But I mean, God loves Asian Americans and African Americans and Latin Americans and Native Americans. He, he loves Americans that, that have cats, 
Uh, he loves you, you guys too. He loves Cuban people, people from Honduras and Nicaragua and Jamaican and Croatia and Russian and Pakistan, Iranians. Uh, he, he loves everybody. God created everyone in heaven can I tell you, is going to be an amazing, wonderful, diverse place. Listen to what it says in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 and 10. It says, There before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And they cried out in a loud, loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. See, heaven, we're going to be together. We should be able to have a meal here on earth. This stuff isn't just hatred. It's the lack of love. It's the absence of love. All these things that we've talked about this whole series have been the absence of love. Love conquers all. It fixes all. And the church is God's plan A to deliver it. We are the hope dealers. Romans 10, 12 says it like this, For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call upon him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Discover Family Church, there is only one true race. The human race. And Jesus gave his life for it. It's not a skin issue, it's a sin issue, and it's not acceptable to God. It's not acceptable to us. Jesus didn't say who to neighbor. Instead, he told us how to neighbor. You cross the street. You want to make a difference? Then make the move. Make some friends. Love some people, whether, whether accidentally or on purpose, you have prejudged or you've ignored Hope dealers, we don't look at color. We just look at the heart. And, and I don't know about you, but I don't want Jesus to just be famous in certain parts of Lakeland. I want everybody to know about him. So as we close, I want to have two prayers. The first is for those of you that have been mistreated. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I might not have caused it. I may not have done it. But Jesus took the blame for something he didn't do when he died on the cross for my sins. And I'm standing here telling you that Jesus loves you, and so do I. So does the church. Please know that at Discover Family Church, we will always be ready to cross the street for you. Father, I lift up those who are walking with pain and hurt for things that have been done to them. God, I know that you are the healer, and it's not just healing the body, but it's healing the soul and the spirit, the mind, bringing wholeness to us. So God, today, I pray that you would bring wholeness into the lives and hearts and minds of people that are walking through a, a history that is so scary that I probably couldn't even comprehend it. Pray that you would show them love and that you would let us at Discover Family Church be a part of showing that love. In Jesus' name. The second group of people I want to talk to is if you're somebody who's done the mistreating, and when I talk about that, I mean all of us, because we've all done it. Every single one of us. We've mistreated. We've prejudged. Whether we've been outright racist, like the world would say it, or whether we've just simply avoided and judged people quietly on our own. Today is a day for repentance, to look into our own hearts and souls, and to start towards the only real unity this world can know. The unity under Jesus is our Savior. 
This isn't a message about politics today. It isn't a message about color. It's a message about love. It's a message about overcoming sin. It's a message about being a neighbor and being a dealer of hope. So let's pray. Father, for each and every one of us that want to make that decision to ask for forgiveness today, we come to you and say, forgive us. We are sorry. We live in a broken world and we are full of sin. Forgive us of that sin. Come into our hearts. Live with us today. And help us to do everything we can to cross the street, to not prejudge, but instead walk in your love, seeking more knowledge and seeking to share your love with those around us. We love you so much today, Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Church, I love each and every one of you. It's a hard message for me to go through today. But I hope you know my heart. My heart is Jesus loves you. I love you too. Jesus wants to see sin pushed out of your life. And he wants to fill that, that hole that's left from that sin with his love. So that you can share it with other people around you. At Discover Family Church, we're going to be a people that empower those that are in poverty. We're going to be a church that loves those that are lonely. We're going to be a church that helps overcome racism and a church that becomes the family to the orphans. That's what God's called us to do. We're hope dealers, and we're going to make Jesus famous in Lakeland. I can't wait to see what he does next. Have a great week, and share this with any friends that you think need to hear it. I love each and every one of you. Bye-bye. Oh, I miss you already. Every one of you. All of you. I miss you so much. Love you.